Hello, everybody. So I think that is now the time to, to retake the webinar and to enjoy with another researcher, another scientist, another mentor, I would say in my case, that does not need any presentation. Nevertheless, I prepared a few lines so I don't forget anything of what I wanted to say. So Dr. Randall Wells directs the Chico, the Chicago Zoological Society, Salsota Dolphin Research Program, which conducts the world's longest running study of wild dolphin population. Indeed, in October 2021, the Sarasota Dolphin Research Program celebrated its 50th anniversary. This is amazing. These are 50 years of study that have been given them an unparalleled window into the world of wild dolphins. Their home, Sarasota Bay, Florida, is a unique natural laboratory where Randy and colleagues have spent half a century studying their lives. And with this, I'm going to leave the floor to Dr. Randy Wells. Off you go, Randy. Thank you, Joan. Thank you for making me feel really old, but I guess it's deserved. I want to, first of all, thank Greg for such a, a great talk. It was truly inspirational and pulled together a lot of aspects that we all need to be reminded of. So thank you, Greg, for imparting your wisdom to us once again. Well, today what I'd like to do is spend some time talking about a little bit of what we've learned from the bottlenose dolphins of Sarasota Bay over the past 50 years. And I'm here speaking at a much smaller level than Greg was. We're not talking worldwide, we're talking about one population of dolphins. But I'm doing it as representative of a team of people, and these are the folks that are outlined to the left, showing their photos, and also all the colleagues that have worked with us over the years to help to learn about these animals. We're a small but merry team of biologists, and we've been blessed to be able to be able to interact with a variety of scientists, students, and volunteers from around the world over the decades. And let's see if we can make this go forward. There we go. Okay. So first of all, a little bit of history. We did not set out to become the world's longest running study of a wild dolphin population. It just kind of worked out that way. Back in the early 1970s, we didn't really know anything about the movement patterns of dolphins in coastal waters. We didn't know whether dolphins seen off Sarasota Bay, Florida, one day might be off the Panhandle of Florida several days later and over in Texas or out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico weeks after that. So in, in 1970, a fellow named Blair Irvine, a fellow on the left-hand side of this photo here, began a pilot study in Sarasota, Florida to put tags on dolphins to learn something about their movement patterns. And he involved his high school volunteer, who was me. So we began working through Moat Marine Laboratory for 1970 to 1972 to learn something about the dolphins. And we quickly learned that we could see some of the same dolphins over and over again with these little plastic tags or the remnants of those tags or scars um, that were left on the fin after the tags came off. We were funded in the mid 70s by the US Marine Mammal Commission to come back in and take another look at this potential population unit. And in this regard, we put more tags out. We put the ancient um, ancestors to radio transmitters on these animals and began to learn more about their movement patterns and got a sense that the animals were not just resonant over short periods of time, but resonant over longer periods of time. In that we actually were able to retag 11 of 12 dolphins we'd first tagged back in 1970, 1971. Since that time, our sense of the residency of these animals has increased through the use of photographic identification. So I'll talk a bit more about each of these things as we go along. So our first discovery and, and perhaps our most important discovery was that these dolphins have home range. We learned that we could find the animals repeatedly and predictably, and that set the stage for everything that we did from that time forward. We learned over the first few years that the animals had a home range that went from southern edge of Tampa Bay up here, southward down to Venice Inlet, and all the inshore waters in between and offshore to within a few kilometers of shore. We learned through satellite lake transmitters and other kinds of tagging, the dolphins were on the move constantly through their core areas. It didn't matter what time of day or night, they didn't have specific patterns to where they would be, but they were using these inshore waters on a regular basis over long periods of time. 
And we subsequently were able to describe for these animals a long-term resident, multi-decadal, multi-generational, year-round community of about 170 individuals. Over the course of our studies since 1970, we've been able to look at six generations spanning as many as five concurrent generations, those that are within a particular lineage at any given time, and including individuals up to about 67 years of age. We've learned that home range stability remains over periods of decades. This is a 50-year-old dolphin, and it shows her sightings with a different color for each decade, moving through the same waters over the course of our studies. We can also say that the animals show stability across, across generations as well. This is one lineage of individuals with the great-great-grandmother FB43 here, but showing all of her offspring and great-grand, great calves moving through the same waters of the range over the course of those five generations. So over the years, while we have about 170 dolphins now, these are the identifiable individuals. We started out with fewer than that when we began our systematic um, studies and using existing techniques for estimating population size over time and for doing surveys. We've seen a general increase in the number of animals using the area on a regular basis to about 170 now. And they have an age structure that looks like this with a great many animals up to about 30 years of age, 35 years of age, then a decline into dolphin old age with our oldest individual being 65 years of age down here. We find similar patterns of residency up and down the west coast of Florida. And it's built on looking at the ranging patterns of the animals and their social association patterns. And it's also based on the genetics of the individuals so that we have a mosaic of these communities in Tampa Bay, where there are multiple ones as described by Kim Urian, in the Gulf of Mexico, and down in Charlotte Harbor, Pine Island Sound, and farther to the north and to the south. But it's a general pattern for this section of the coastline. So our approach is for individual studies of animals, longitudinal monitoring of, their, of these individuals to already learn about their behavior, their health, their biology, ecology, and their ecosystem as well. The things that go into creating a natural laboratory situation are techniques such as monthly photographic identification surveys, where we go out for 10 days each month to keep track of the individually recognizable individuals and who they're with, where they're spending time, and what kind of condition they're in. Periodically, we engage in catch and release health assessments where a small segment of the population is caught briefly examined by veterinarians, biologists, and released on site with the samples and information, helping us to understand their status, their health, and life history patterns of the animals. We recognize that we needed to put our understanding of these animals into an ecological perspective to really understand why they were doing things. So in 2004, we initiated persaining to be able to assess prey fish availability. And we do this on a seasonal basis to let us know the relative availability of dolphin prey. For those animals that aren't available to us for the catch and release health assessment work, we use biopsy dart sampling a technique that's used around the world. We're able to engage in focal animal behavioral follows to keep track of these distinctive individual animals and systematically record their, be their behavior to better understand how they fit within the social system. Recently, we've engaged in developing a system of passage, passive acoustic listening stations around Sarasota Bay. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. As appropriate for particular questions, we use tagging and tracking, and we work closely with Moat Marine Laboratories Stranding Investigations Program to understand what brings about the demise of these animals. Over the course of the years, we've been able to learn something about the life history patterns of these animals. We've learned that females reach sexual maturity at about five to 10 years of age with the average age at first birth of 9.6 years. We've learned that males never mature, no, nope, sorry, that's humans. Males reach sexual maturity at about 10 years of age. Most of the calves in Sarasota are born during May to July after about a 12 and a half month gestation period. And based on examination of ultrasound diagnoses of pregnancies, 83% of the pregnancies result in live calves. Remember this number when we talk later about the Deepwater Horizon. Our mothers range in age from six to 48 years at the time that they give birth. And we've observed them with as many as 11 calves over the course of their lifetime, and some of those have not yet reached their 40s, so they may have more in them. They invest on average about three to six years in each calf, 
and this varies with their age, but the uh, with the age of the mothers, but the average age of association, uh, duration of associations is about 4.2 years. We've defined reproductive senescence. Females go 13 years without giving birth to a calf, we define as having reached a post-reproductive period. Paternity patterns have been determined from sampling males in the area. And we've learned that males that are siring offspring are anywhere from 10 to 43 years of age, and they've produced as many as seven offspring um, per, per male to date. Our studies have allowed us to look at the social structure of these animals and identify fluid groupings in a fission-fusion kind of society. Our dolphins don't live in a human kind of mom, dad, and kid grouping patterns, and they don't live in pods and where the peas in the pod can't go anyplace. They are changing their groupings, but they're changing it within constraints defined by three basic kinds of social units. We see nursery groups, which are mothers with their most recent calves, we have juvenile groups that are of mixed sex. And then when the males reach sexual maturity, just beyond that, they usually form a pair bond with another male and form a very strong alliance that will last for the lifetime of the individuals. And this presumably provides increased reproductive success as well as opportunities for protection and for improvement in foraging strategy and foraging success. We've learned that along with the complexities of the social structure, there's also complexities in their communication systems. We've been very fortunate to be able to work with researchers from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and the University of St. Andrews to try to understand how the dolphins especially use their whistle sounds. We've been doing these studies with them during the health assessments to understand which dolphins produce which sounds and confirm the hypothesis of signature whistles or individually specific whistles for each individual and then to try to learn how they use these individually specific whistles through playback experiments. And the general consensus now is that these individually specific whistles serve basically as names for these animals that they recognize when called or that they use to contact other individuals. This has been observed when we've released the animals with small acoustic digital archival tags or d-tags and observe them and record them in unrestrained circumstances as well. Recognizing the importance of the ecological perspective, we've worked to understand how these animals uh, obtain the fish that they, they catch and what the relative proportions are of the fish that they, that they eat. We thank Dr. Nelio Barros, who unfortunately is no longer with us, but who taught us a great deal about the diets of bottomnose dolphins. We learned that they eat a tremendous variety of fish. And we learned that among the, the favorite fish that they eat are those that produce sound or soniferous fish. They take those disproportionately from their availability within the environment. <clears throat> While the fish they eat most commonly are sparrows, including pinfish, this is kind of like the rice in their diet. And these other fish, the toadfish, uh, the sea trout, and others that produce sounds are the ones that they actually actively go out and select. And so I'll play for you some of the sounds that are the lunch bell for these animals, even though they're not all of that attractive or appetizing to my mind, this is what a yummy toadfish sounds like. Okay, and then the spotted sea trout, which is perhaps a bit more appetizing. Oftentimes what you hear are choruses of these fish during the breeding season. So among the other aspects of the complexities for these animals, are how they share information both uh, horizontally within the community and vertically from generation to generation. And this is exemplified in the kinds of feeding patterns the animals exist or uh, exhibit. A couple of feeding patterns that we observe that take learning to be able to perfect are fish whacking, where they will chase down fish and strike them with their flukes in shallow waters, oftentimes send them flying, or kerplunking, where the dolphins will take their flukes, drive them through the water column, creating a geyser and entraining bubbles and making a lot of noise and driving fish out of hiding places where they can pick them up. We see other individuals, especially young individuals, practicing these behaviors and perfecting them. They've also demonstrated that they learn about the risks of particular kinds of fish. And we observe them catching catfish, which have venomous spines on their dorsal and on their flipper or their pectorals, and they bite the tails off these fish, leaving the heads to continue to try to swim as they consume the tails. 
They also learn other kinds of feeding behavior, behaviors, and these are interactions with fisheries. And they pass these on from generation to generation as well, putting individual dolphins at risk across generations. Here are two different lineages, four generation and three generation lineage. Anything with a red outline indicates a human interaction that involves an unnatural behavior. If there's a slash, it means the animal is either dead or disappeared. If there's a plus, it means that there's an injury from that human interaction. And in these particular cases, these original mothers engage in a lot of interactions with, with anglers, especially spending time around their boats, taking fish from them, taking fish from their gear. And it's resulted in the loss of a number of individuals in subsequent generations. What we find is that these animals, once they begin to exhibit this kind of conditioned behavior of learning that humans are a source of food, increase their risk of being injured further on in life to a greater extent than individuals that don't engage in this kind of behavior. This is from work from Frederick Christensen and colleagues. So it results in injuries that can lead to very serious consequences for these individuals, and it can sometimes lead to direct death as well. About a third of the animals that disappear from Sarasota are eventually recovered as carcasses and investigated by Moat Marine Laboratory's Stranding Investigations Program. They're picked up off the beach, brought back to the lab where, they're invest where they are examined through necropsies and stomach contents and other samples are measured as well. In all, we see that these studies demonstrate about 25% of the deaths of dolphins in Sarasota Bay can be attributed to human interactions especially through recreational gear interactions. And as conservation scientists, it's these mortalities that are the ones of greatest interest to us as something that we can possibly mitigate. Unfortunately, the dolphins don't get to choose which of the many threats they face at any given time. They have to deal with disease issues, failure to thrive, predators, stingray barbs, harmful algal blooms, and then anthropogenic sources such as fishing gear, fishing line, fishing nets, crab trap lines, pollution of various kinds, noise in their environment, boats causing disturbance or actual strikes, um, hurricanes, climate change in some places, oil spills and oil development activities, uh, pesticide runoff, industrial activities, destruction of the shoreline, and human feeding of these animals, which changes their behaviors, puts them at risk, and makes about this much sense. Among the examples of how they face multiple threats at any given time, we can look at things like red tide harmful algal blooms, which are not uncommon along the west coast of Florida. In 2005, 2006, there was a harmful algal bloom that created concurrent ecological and anthropogenic threats. These, this algae all right here, this dinoflagellate, releases neurotoxins when the cells lice. And these neurotoxins kill fish, they kill birds, turtles, manatees, and in some cases, dolphins. When the cell counts get above 100,000 cells per liter is when you begin to see fish kills. And in 2005, that was the case for most of the year with another pulse in 2006. So over the course of 2005, 2006, there were times when the cell cows counts got to be more than 10 million cells per liter. Our dolphins stayed, although they changed their habitat use and social activity patterns. There were not very many, if any, mortalities directly attributable to the brevitoxins themselves. Instead, what we saw were ecological impacts. We saw a decline of about 75% of the primary prey fish these dolphins would eat. And this led to a decline in the dolphin abundance, some animals emigrating, no animals immigrating in. We also saw the loss of half of the two-year-old calves, the most vulnerable segment of the population that's in the process of learning how to capture prey and um, it weaning from their mothers. The remaining two-year-old calves were 20% underweight. We also saw a marked increase in human interactions as can be seen in these graphs here. There were more cases of dolphins approaching boats, approaching people and doing inappropriate foraging techniques or approaches to humans. And in fact, we lost 2% of our dolphins to ingestion of fishing gear during this time. The humans and the dolphins were vying for the same few remaining fish. Another case of a severe red tide occurred in 2018, 2019, where we had con uh, multiple concurrent physiological and ecological threats. 
but less human interaction. This was a different kind of a red tide in terms of how it came through the area. It moved in from the south and, trans and translated to the north over time. There were extremely high cell counts of up to 90 million cells per liter. And during this particular red tide, we put together new research approaches to try to understand the red tide by looking at the soundscape of the animals and looking at stable isotopes to see whether or not there was a change in the prey items that the dolphins were eating to be able to stay in the area. And recognizing the human interactions that occurred in association with the previous red tide, we began preemptive outreach as soon as possible to let people know what the possibility was and to try to, to get anglers to reduce their interactions with these dolphins. This time we had direct impacts from the, from the brevitoxin on the animals, losing four of our dolphins to the brevitoxins. The dolphins still remained in the area as they had in 2005, 2006, but they moved in, in greater frequency into creeks and river habitats where the red tide organism can't survive. And while we saw declines in body condition, the declines were not nearly as severe. The loss of fish was just as severe or greater with 88% of the prey being lost, but we learned from stable isotopes that the dolphins were shifting their prey to clupeas, scaled sardines, menhaden, and other small schooling fish that are less impacted by the red tide. We also saw that the primary prey fish bounced back very quickly within a few months of the red tide, and we did not have any gear ingestion cases this time. Instead, what we had were multiple cases of calves becoming entangled in gear as their mothers were hanging out in the same areas where anglers were still working. Differently though, this time we saw a record number of shark bites, a different kind of ecological impact. We'll talk about that in a moment. We implemented a new tool this time around to try to understand the uh, impacts of red tide and, and in general looking at the effects of of boats, uh, prey, dolphin sounds, and manatees by monitoring from passive acoustic listening stations scattered around the bay. The network has grown to about 10 stations now, but the first one that was active and monitored carefully during this red tide showed us a great deal. This is a sound spectrogram from that station before the red tide moved into this area. And in this, we have frequency along the y-axis, time along the x-axis, and each of the light colored pink bands is an indication of biological sounds that are indications of a happy, healthy ecosystem. So I'll play this and we'll see. So there were a number of things that could be heard in there. I know it's faint and I apologize for that, but there was this basic carpet of sound down here, this chorus of fish sounds, a lot of fish in the area. The crackling bacon sounds were uh, primarily snapping shrimp, invertebrates that were in the area. There were echolocation clicks going on. This is what the ecosystem is supposed to sound like. This exact same station one month later showed none of that activity other than one lonely toadfish that would occasionally make noise down here. The red tide was devastating and changed the ecology of, of the uh, area. As I mentioned before, we had a different kind of impact from the red tide. Dr. Jane Gardner, New College of Florida, was documenting the presence of sharks and rays in the area associated with the red tide and noted that as it moved into the area from July into August, as the red tide counts, cell counts became higher, sharks and rays left the area, and the rays never really came back uh, until much later and then not in the same numbers as they were there before. We've documented a similar pattern in our purse seine operations, and we saw that there was a decline in the rays during this last time period. And at other times, when we've seen decline in ray availability, we've seen an increase in shark bites on dolphins. And in fact, in this case, we saw record numbers of shark bites on dolphins in 2019 and 2020. And we'd seen this inverse relationship at several other times historically as well. And what we believe is going on is that the rays, which are primary prey items for, the, for sharks, such as bull sharks, when they are gone from the area from having either died or migrated out of the area in advance of a red tide, it leaves the sharks looking for another prey item. Dolphins are a possibility for that. And so we see an increase in these bites on the dolphins. And we see at the same time with it, a decreasing availability of rays, we see an increase in the loss of young of the year calves 
that we suspect, although we can't say for sure, but we suspect that these bite-sized morsels are lost. They don't live to show a scar. The calves are small enough to be taken as prey and are lost completely. So what can we do in terms of mitigation for these animals? We engage in public outreach to the best extent that we can, trying to educate the public about the needs of the animals and what they can do to improve their lives through PSAs, books, uh, fishing cards, um, engaging in, in speaking engagements and that sort of thing. We also engage in interactions and interventions with these animals when the National Marine Fisheries Service under NOAA considers them to be life-threatening interactions. And so we go in and we work with our colleagues along the west coast of Florida to be able to rescue these animals and remove the gear from them, do what's necessary to be able to get them back out to be productive members of the ecosystem. In this particular photo right here, there's four mother calf pairs. Three of the mothers had been involved in interventions and without those interventions likely would not have been in this picture nor would their calves have been in this picture. In a recent paper that was published by Katie McHugh and colleagues, they were able to demonstrate through modeling that this sort of one animal at a time rescue does add up. It does lead to changing the population trajectory and actually is a viable tool for helping to restore populations in some areas. Other ways that we can engage in mitigation is by preparing the next generation. So we engage in training opportunities for grad students, interns, volunteers, and international colleagues. We've had over 400 interns at this point from around the world who have worked with us and a number of trainees from other countries that come in to learn the techniques that we use. And with our graduate students, we've had 89 graduate students who have participated. One of our interns put together this academic kelp with each branch being a different university and each leaf being a student who have, has obtained either data, samples, guidance, or done their field work here in Florida as well. Sarasota dolphins also benefit dolphins in other places by serving as a reference population because we do have so much information on them. And this was especially true during the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. When the dolphins in Sarasota Bay were compared to the dolphins up in Barataria Bay, where the oil came ashore in a Mississippi Sound, it was found that the animals were at much worse health over much longer periods of time up here than the unoiled animals here in Sarasota Bay. The Barataria dolphins didn't leave Barataria Bay during the oil spill, which shows them swimming through oil up there. They were found during health assessments to be five times more likely to have moderate to severe lung disease as Sarasota Bay dolphins. The disease conditions in the Barataria dolphins were significantly greater in prevalence and severity than those in Sarasota dolphins, and they were consistent with what you might expect from oil exposure and toxicity. Most importantly, what they found was there was low reproductive success in Barataria Bay compared to Sarasota Bay. 20% of the pregnancies resulted in live calves as compared to that 83% figure that I showed you before for Sarasota Bay. And it demonstrated that there was low annual survival, year-to-year -year survival of only 87% of Barataria Bay versus 96% in Sarasota Bay. And these factors, the, the dramatic change, differences in the health, the dramatic reproductive and survival data are some of the things that helped to encourage BP to go to the negotiation of the settlement table rather than following the court case all the way through. We're also able to develop techniques that can be used in other places in Sarasota Bay. For example, we worked with Peter Tyak and his team on DTAG since the 1990s, these digital archival tags that have been developed and tested and applied to a variety of species in various places and told us a great deal about how these animals communicate with one another um, as they're moving through the environment and we can record the sounds that they're producing. We've worked with wildlife computers to try to reduce the size of satellite link transmitters over the years and increase the, uh, increase the effectiveness but decrease the impact on the animals from these small tags. Now with a single AA battery, we can get signals from these animals over many months time anywhere in the world. In order to try to take greater advantage of these techniques in places where we can't do the kinds of things we can in Sarasota like catch and release work, we've been working to develop a pole that we call that the tadpole quite affectionately, but a pole, ma pole mounted tag application device that can be used from the bow of a vessel to attach a tag to the dorsal fin of the animals. And we have not yet put it on dolphins, but we did work with colleagues who used our tadpole to put tags on great white sharks last fall. 
And so it's already been demonstrated as a conservation tool. We look forward to seeing more of that. As an example of what can be done with some of these techniques when you put them together in places where the animals are more difficult to study, we worked with colleagues from Oceanographic and Dolphin Quest in 2016 to put satellite link tags and D tags on dolphins off Bermuda. And we demonstrated patterns of movement, including one animal who went to sea mounts and circumnavigated the Sargasso Sea, moving in areas where we've never tracked animals before, while others remained very close to the the pedestal and the associated seamounts of Bermuda. And we were able to look at the diving patterns, including demonstrating dives to a thousand meters. The dolphins in Sarasota Bay can't go nearly that far. In fact, here's a comparison from a D tag showing the dive patterns of Sarasota up here in this narrow strip. And that on D tags going down to over to about 400 meters. And Franz Jensen worked up these data and demonstrated that the animals don't just feed at depth, but they're also feeding in the water column and even at the surface of the water, showing us new things about how these animals survive. And finally, we're able to put our, our opportunities and our expertise to use to provide training, consultations, and assistance with field projects for a variety of other species around the world. And we're happy to do that. We'd love to have the opportunity to work with our colleagues and make whatever difference we can to benefit the animals. So in summary, we find that there's a lot of value to long-term study. While we didn't start out intending to be doing a long-term study, as we got to know the individuals better, as we got to learn that we could find them repeatedly, they became even more fascinating with what they could tell us. And so it's just gone on over time. But this has allowed us to look at aspects of the biology, behavior, and conservation in ways that hadn't been possible before. So long-term data collection, especially when it's done consistently and continuously, can establish baselines. It can define the, the ranges of normal variability. It can provide context and perspective, and it can facilitate the detection of trends. One trend that we are pleased to see is looking at environmental contaminants. This is work by John Kuklick and colleagues, showing the levels of some of the legacy contaminants that were in Sarasota dolphins up through the mid 2000s. And comparing that to what we see now, there's been a decline. It's still not down where we want it to be, but it's moving in the right direction. Long-term study allows us to monitor, and as Greg mentioned in his talk, monitoring is an important aspect of the feedback for being able to continue to, to put pressure on for management. Long-term study provides opportunities to establish and test standard approaches that can facilitate comparisons over time and across study sites. And as more and more People are working with dolphins in similar situations of residency. Knowing that we're collecting data in similar ways allows us to really make the comparisons that allow us to better understand the biology of these animals and the factors that are shaping their behavior, the biology, and how they're responding to the threats. And finally, the long-term study provides opportunities to learn about the full richness of the lives of long-lived animals and to appreciate them as individuals. And this is something that has helped to keep us going. It's as much about caring about the animals and what happens to them as it is about getting the science um, out there and published where it can be used. And we've come to know these animals in Sarasota Bay in ways that few people have had the opportunity to do over the years. And we're very appreciative of that opportunity and of all the help we've had to be able to learn about these animals the way that we have over the years. And with that, Joanne, I think I'm, I'm ready to take some questions. And would you okay. like me to stop sharing my screen? Okay, so, well, I, it's kind of impressive. I always get, you know, kind of frozen after these presentations of reviewing, well, these presentations. 50 years of work is just amazing. I will, I will check now the questions. So we have a first question from Andrea Carolina Pedrazzini. She's saying, having seen the high risk of injuries and deaths in these related dolphins, is there any evidence of learned avoidance behavior in the more recent generations? Or do these negative effects of interactions do not seem to affect their behaviors and tendency to approach boats and fishermen? I wish I could say that there was positive learning experience going on, but unfortunately with these food related experiences like approaching anglers, it's very much a situation where the dolphins are rewarded for making their approaches. And so all it takes is 
an intermittent reward for that, an occasional fish that's thrown to them to reinforce coming close to a boat and putting themselves at risk. So we're not seeing the animals learning to stay away from the situation. As Greg said, it's more an issue where we need to manage the people and their behavior and not put the onus on the dolphins to have to learn how to do things differently because they're not going to. Thank you very much. Very clear response. So we have another question in this case from Robin Verd. In hindsight, what would you have done differently in the first 10 years of your work based on what you know now? <laughs> what a good question. I would like to ask him the same question. <laughs> I think what I would have done recognizing the way things have gone now is put much more time into the maths. I was, I was a biologist at that point, that meant something different than it does now. And Greg's point about understanding how these animals work and being able to back up the planning and the protection of these animals through modeling is something that has taken on increasing importance over the years. And I, I wish I had developed a stronger statistical and mathematical background at that time. But otherwise, there's very little that I would trade in terms of the experiences and the opportunities that I've had over the years. There really wasn't a field of marine mammal science when I started in this. I had the benefit of working with some of the very early founders in the field and some of the, the folks that, that really helped to bring it to where it is now, the shoulders that we all stand on. And, and I'm very thankful for that. Perhaps one thing I would do is I would have appreciated that more at the time. Okay, we have a question from Lisa. Lisa is asking a question that probably many of the among the audience are, are wondering. She's asking, has the Sarasota population become habituated to being captured and released after 50 years of, in brackets, training? One of the things that we learned early on was that the animals respond in a way that allows us to do this. Um, time and time again. When we first started catching the animals, we learned that the first capture of the animal, the animals would typically thrash and, and be difficult to handle for a period of time until they were restrained. But if they were caught a second time, you oftentimes would not see that same behavior. And it got to the point where I can walk into the middle of a net corral, put my arms around a 300 kilogram male and walk him over to a sling all by myself. Uh, I don't advise that, don't do it at home. But it is a situation, I don't know what's going on in their heads, but either they learn that it's not going to last that long or it's not going to be that bad. Um, I don't know, but it, it has allowed us to be able to do this without the increase in negative response by the animals over time. It's worked out in our favor to be able to be able to collect the data that have proved so important for these animals. Uh, then another question from Aviad Chainin. He's saying the preference of sound producing fish as spray is very interesting. Do they have, do you have an explanation for these findings? Yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm neither an acoustician nor an ichthyologist, but the best indication we have is we know that the dolphins are not constantly producing their echolocation. Their sonar requires energy. It lets other individuals know where they are. And it also lets the fish know in some cases that they are being targeted. So being able to listen for the fish in the very murky waters of our estuary and be able to zero in on them using the fish's own sounds probably gives the dolphins an opportunity to get closer without being detected. And then they can use their sonar at the very end to, to finally guide their approach to be able to grab the fish at the end. Okay, another question. This case from Manel Gazo from Submon. Uh, thanks for this great talk, Randy. Not being the major cause of death, you showed that also in Sarasota, by, in Sarasota, by catch or damage with nets is common. Uh, predatory behavior seems to be learned, and dolphins will be there in the nets, taking big risk for an easy uh, to obtain meal. So, do you think that this feeding behavior could be unlearned? Any chances for research in this field? Well, in, in our area, no. There was a constitutional amendment in the state of Florida in 1995 that moved large gillnets offshore. 
So our dolphins have not had to contend with much in the way of nets for more than 25 years now. Um, in other places, people have tried to use noise-making devices and that sort of thing to keep dolphins away from nets. But anytime a dolphin gets a food reward for a behavior that they've engaged in, it increases the likelihood of them doing that behavior again. So if they are able to successfully get fish out of a net from time to time without it killing them, then it's something that we're likely going to continue to see. Okie dokie. Then one from Pine, Eisfeld Pier Antonio, which is somehow related to the, to the let's say, to the catch and release of, of, the, of your dolphins. She's asking, how did you determine your oldest dolphins that your all the oldest dolphins are around 65 years old, please. Yeah, in, in the early days of the, the program, when we were doing our catch and release work, primarily to learn about life history patterns before we got into the health assessment aspect, we would obtain the information from examination of a tooth. A veterinarian would obtain a, a tooth under local anesthesia. You would section, stain the tooth, look at it under, under a microscope, and the dolphins deposit growth layer groups um, that are very accurate, very precise, and allow you to determine the age. So we did that with this dolphin, Nick Lowe, early on when she was in her 30s, and then just added one year on for each of the years we observed her after that time. Nowadays, we know most of the animals from their birth dates because we've been following their mothers and their grandmothers over time. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna do another two questions. So there is from Ami Mairo, uh, great talk. I was wondering, do you have an explanation for the older age at sexual maturity for males compared to females? Most of the time you see males in other species getting mature earlier compared to females, or is this normal for Boronos dolphins? Well, uh, in looking at the average, it is about the same for the males and the females. We see the first calf born at a little bit over nine years of age for the females, but we do see that they can become sexually mature at five years of age and can produce a calf in some cases when they're six years of age. So I think it's within the range of variability that you would expect for these animals. In places where males have been under human care, there have been males that are seven years old that have produced offspring. So I think there's just a wide range of variability within the population. In terms of those males that are allowed to reproduce, it's probably social factors that are, enter into it. Even if they're physiologically capable of producing sperm, they may not be allowed to put them to good use until they're a little bit older in life. And then a last question, and then we will leave it here and give a break, a well-deserved break to Randy. So this is from Jeremy Kiska. Hey Randy, did you record long-term changes in calf survivor or scalp survival or adult reproductive success, success over time within Sarasota Bay? We are seeing what we believe is an increase in survival of firstborn calves. Um, now that we're seeing a decline in these environmental contaminants that had been above threshold levels for effects on health and reproduction. So we do feel like we're seeing an improvement of that. That's part of the increase in the number of, of animals that we see in Sarasota Bay over time. And that, along with increased resources in the Bay with that net ban that I mentioned before, have led to the, the overall general increase in the number of animals that we've observed over the decades. Okay. So thank you very much, Randy. Also in this case, I mean, the reaction in the chat and from the audience is, is outstanding and people are very grateful of your presentation. And of course, not only the presentation, but literally, I mean, 50 years of work um, it's very impressive. Uh, so a round of applause goes to you, also virtual round of applause, unfortunately. And, and please forward our respect and gratitude and, and, and efforts to the recognition to your, to your team and to all your collaborators from, from all of us. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you all. Okay, so we're going to leave it here. Uh, let me remind you that the recordings of the presentations of today and the following days will be uh, shared eventually, probably or surely next week. You all will receive some communication through the usual channels of the ECS, social media, etc. So stay tuned and do not forget that we have still two days ahead of webinar with equally brilliant presentations. Thank you very much to everybody.